Now, people might wonder why we're in a different location, <laughs> apart from the fact that we needed to find some, a little bit of tree shelter for, um, to avoid the rain. But also, um, I think our nation's on a bit of a hikoi full stop, or in English, a, a walk, a walkabout, a stroll, um, hopefully in the direction of a better country. Now, most people watching this know I'm relatively neutral political-wise. I do have my leanings that some people are aware of. But um, talking to you, I'm wanting to find out the direction you want people to go for a stroll in when it comes to the direction of this country and where we're going and what we're going to accomplish and essentially how we're going to make New Zealand a far better place than it is and one of those things is wealth distribution. Um, I know everyone talks about wealth distribution and every party's got its own version of that but I'd like you to explain both the essence of wealth distribution as it needs to be thought about and how it relates to um, the New Zealand um, Constitution Party. Um. As a treaty lawyer and as a constitutional lawyer, I haven't actually done cases in that arena. I have personal views. Yeah. When we talk about wealth, uh, we need to contextualise that wealth. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a arena, couple of different types of wealth. People think of wealth as piles of gold, right? But there are other types of wealth as correct. well that's, that are important to keep in mind and not allow the pile of gold to overshadow other forms of wealth. So let's talk about those other forms. Yeah. Those other forms are natural resources. Yeah. And so if we're talking about wealth in that context, then the answer I would give would be different to the answer I would give in terms of a pot of gold. Yeah. So here in New Zealand, there is an assumption by the Crown that it owns all natural resources. The purpose of a written constitution is to identify who actually owns those natural resources. And in all countries that have a written constitution, almost every written constitution identifies the people as being the owners of those yes. natural resources. And that's something I think people, when they're thinking about politics and governments and people, need to keep in mind is the difference between government and people. Correct. The government is the employee of the people, in theory, and that's how it's supposed to work. So therefore, the government can't own something that belongs to the people. What a written constitution does, it transports theory into reality. Okay. And under a New Zealand written constitution, I would ensure or I would like to encourage New Zealanders to see the natural resources as being their own, mm. not being owned by an artificial entity. corporation yeah. or an artificial entity, which is supposed to be working on our behalf, acting yeah. on our behalf, which doesn't. I want to make it quite clear in my view concerning the Crown. Yeah. Do, the you, Crown do you also... Let me make yeah, the yeah, view. Sorry. Uh, the Crown acts for the Crown. Yeah. The Crown acts in the best interest of the Crown. It doesn't act in the best interest of the people. Yeah. It is a, an instrument of ex executive power uh, for the benefit of a select few. Yeah. Uh, a written constitution turns that around. Yeah. And it, it identifies rightly that the Crown and in terms of the New Zealand experience, my, my is the instrument to the yeah. serving of the people. Yeah. 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 As, a, as a politician and a leader of this party, you also see... As an educator. <laughs> as an educator. <laughs> haven't been you, appointed as a politician yet. Do you, do you also see that um, the owners of that, those resources, the, the people, also have... Um, a responsibility, and it's not just responsibility in looking after it, it's responsibility when it comes to um, creating, through, through the government itself, the laws that define what people can and can't do when it comes to 
the treatment of that, that resource, i.e. we own the resource, we allow the government to um, create laws on our behalf that we, have, that we have input into shaping those laws so that everyone knows the rules as to how you treat those resources and we have a responsibility to take part in that and ensure that the government does what we want them to do. Yes, thank you for answering the question that you posed. <laughs> <laughs> I would have given the same answer. Um, everything that you said, fundamentally we know to be true, but in practice it doesn't happen. Yeah, which is a bit of a pity, but you know, hopefully um, we can fix that. Yes, uh, and we do fix that by inviting everybody to be politically involved. At the very least, the way they can be politically involved is to vote. Yeah. At a more substantive level, uh, level the way they can be involved is actually become a member of a political party. Yeah. If you uh, seek an employment within a particular field or profession, and you are starting off on that down that career pathway, the uh, most soundest, of, soundest advice that one can uh, follow is to actually be part of a union. Yes. And the collective supports you. Yeah. So that you don't have to fight the big fight, battle the big battle yeah. on your own. The union has delegates who represent the union members, and then they can fight the big fight on your behalf, unless you have a union has a constitution. Yeah, and a lot of people potentially watching this are probably reasonably aware that one of my underwriting things between videos like this and the photography I do is to get you, the people, to actually get off your backsides and at least vote. I didn't say that. <laughs> no, if you if you take a further interest and go beyond just voting and actually being involved in a political party um, to help shape things and um, get things moving in a, in a better direction, that's even better. But the essential thing is that people get out and vote because people often forget that they have a lot of power if they work as a group. One bee by itself it's going to have a miserable life, but when you get a hive full of bees working together, they make beautiful sweet honey. And we as a people, if we work together and come together, even if we have different political views, the fact that we all take part in the voting process helps us create a country that is a representation of, or government that is a representation of the majority of the people, and therefore and we can, and their values, right? yes, and therefore we can create a society that is a better representation of the majority of the people, not just a small cluster. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Lance, the reason why people don't get involved is because they've got bills to pay. The necessities of life force them to focus their attention on, on other important things. Yeah. Not that democracy is important, but democracy in and of itself doesn't pay the bills. No. So people are forced to actually do the things that they need to do so that they can pay their bills. That's why, generally speaking, we don't have very many people getting involved. Now, I, uh, I agree with the comments that you made as to the reason why we ought to get involved. But there is another level that we can get involved in, which is very, very uh, minimalistic in terms of requiring a financial input yeah. And a input in time, um, and that is by adopting a written constitution that identifies all of the values that we hold to be important, and we let the, that constitution speak for ourselves when we cannot speak. We yeah. let that constitution work for us when we cannot work. Yeah. We let that constitution stand for us when we cannot stand, so that we can go back to doing what we need to do to live. Yeah. So, And we can have the confidence that when a bunch of politicians decide to make a law, that they've got to check it against the Constitution and go, oh, no, that contradicts the Constitution. We'll have to throw that, that 
we, we can't yeah. continue creating that law, we've got to do it differently or come up with something yeah. else. You and I talked about, uh, a couple of days ago, about a bill that went through government, uh, through the House. Yeah. Uh, I think it was something to do with uh, tax. Oh, the CGT, that the, the capital gains tax that went through and then fell on its face. It, yep. it, it hasn't gone any, it hasn't become um, law. They haven't, there is no Correct. capital gains tax. And you identified current. a few reasons why. What were those reasons? Um, one of them is the breadth that, that that act was going to touch. It was going to touch things that potentially shouldn't be touched by an act like that because it depends on what what you consider to be capital gains. Um, for instance, I've got some expensive camera gear and I know that with camera gear most lenses do not devalue much if at all and certain cameras and certain levels of lenses you potentially could sell a lens 10 years down the track for more than you originally paid for it. Now potentially, and you've got to be careful about how politicians word acts of parliament and, you know, and laws, um, potentially an act like that could mean that I'd have to pay capital gains on the sale of a camera lens, right, whereas a lot of the um, issues to do with capital gains are more on people who have made a lot of money from property investment and, and, and sale of, of houses and things like this where they haven't been taxed um, and things like that. And I've always been a bit, of a bit afraid of government making laws when they haven't fully thought through not just how it works today, but how it will work in in the future. You know, right. a copyright copyright law, for instance, was written centuries yeah. ago, um, and it's not a hundred percent perfect for our current environment with digital media and all that sort of thing. And there's a number of laws like that um, that have to be modernised. Yeah, they, yeah. Free speech is another one. Yeah, free speech and social media. The two, are, you, the the two have a little bit of conflict area there because of the desire to restrict certain types of of hate speech, which is fine. But how that's implemented, and how if you go writing a law to do with that, it gets a bit tricky because it leaves a lot of holes in it, and. Yeah. It causes a lot more problems than it's than it's worth, because it can capture things that are not to do with hate right. speech, but are to do with standing up for your own rights or for the rights of your community. You're actually talking about standards, yeah. Right? Um, and those standards uh, inform the government as to what the, they can and cannot do. Yeah. Uh, and you're talking about standards in respect to certain freedoms that we believe that we have, what we actually don't have. Um, when you have those freedoms at the sufferance of the government, it's not a freedom, right? No, because technically the government could take away those so-called freedoms if they so desire at any point. Correct. Because they're not set in stone. So a written constitution, one of the reasons why people are afraid of it is because It'll be written in stone and it cannot be changed. Well, no, a constitution can be as stoic as you want it to be, or you can have it as flexible as you want it to be. That's the choice of those who are responsible to uh, make political decisions, uh, exercising public power, spending public monies. Yeah. Um, it's for them to determine uh, how flexible or how rigid they're going to be. Yeah. But unless you've got a written constitution that identifies what you can and cannot do and respect the freedoms that you, we don't know whether or not we have, you're not going to be able to create a stable uh, democratic system yeah. for its people. And you cannot say for certainty that your future is clear. Yeah. And you cannot make decisions and choices for the future unless you have a standard 
to measure your political decisions and the written constitution does yeah. that. We go back to our discussion uh, about distribution of wealth. There is assumption that the Crown owns all the lands, assets and resources. No, it's, uh, uh, yes it is an assumption. No, it's not right that they own it because they, the Crown never bought one acre of land in New Zealand since 1840. Yeah. So how can you say, or how can anybody say the Crown owns the land, and how can anybody say the Crown owns the assets, lands and the resources that have assumed ownership? So who actually owns the lands, assets and resources? And the answer is the people. Yeah, and that, that's underpinned by the fact that you look at the number of places we consider to be public access or public spaces, right, because we go, we are the people, this is not someone's private land that they, that they own, this is a public space. You know, in the case of Hamilton, Garden Place. Yes, the council manage it, but it's a public space. So long as you take the responsibility to stick within certain guidelines, you can pretty much <coughs> use that space how you like. Great. Um, there's certain guidelines that are there for the safety of others and to not inconvenience the majority of the people and to keep it available for everyone to use. Um, mm. And that's the whole... To me, that's the whole concept of how we treat the greater um, yep. public um, assets and uh, the trees, the land, the, the mm. oceans, you know, the fishing resources, all that sort of thing. Yeah. You're talking about, if I follow you, administrative law. How yeah. do I administer these things? Yeah. Before you can have good administrative laws, you're going to have to have a document which says that you have these rights and you don't have these rights and the administrative law acts in harmony of, in respect of what rights you have and what yeah. rights you don't have uh, concerning the, the natural world. Yeah. So Before because you can have that law that's working uh, and a reflection of the values of people, you've got to first have uh, a document which says that you can do and cannot do these laws and then uh, the yeah. administrative law can act appropriately. I can't see how New Zealand can actually uh, function now that we are no longer a bicultural uh, peoples. I cannot see how it can function effectively now that we are multicultural peoples without a written constitution. Yeah. We're going to have chaos. Um, I said in a statement some time ago that at the Several years ago, well, several decades ago, uh, there was only about 1 million, 1.2 million people, and it doubled to 2 million people. Really, you didn't need a written constitution because there was no expectation that that population would increase uh, in a relatively yeah. short period of time. Yes, it would increase, but over a long period of time, right? Yeah. And we looked to the courts and the government to develop our jurisprudence over time. We run out of time. Yeah, because yeah. we now have cultures coming into New Zealand and they've earned the right to be New Zealanders. Yeah. And they've earned the right to same, have the same rights and privileges as everybody else. Yeah. But those rights have not been defined. Yeah. You're going to have a situation. Uh, let's look at what's going to happen if we don't have a written constitution. You're going to have a situation where you're going to have a population greater than Pākehā, greater than Māori, who are going to get into the power. No disrespect to the Asians, they outnumber the Māori. No disrespect to the Indians, they are almost outnumbering Māori. No disrespect to the Muslims, they have about 45,000 members here. That will increase. Mm. Asians will increase in numbers. Mm. Uh, Indian community will increase in numbers to the point where they're going to be a, a majority, not a minority. Yeah. So if we don't have a constitution, who is shaping our future? You got it. Yeah. And the, that shaping will be done by the minority communities who become the majority in the yeah. community. So it's important that we look to forming a written constitution that has common points of interest, common points of value, common constitutional points of mores yeah. by which we can agree. Yeah. A good example for those that have trouble envisaging this 
is this country was populated entirely by Māori. Europeans came here and they were the major minority. They became the majority and formed the laws of, of the, the land and the, and the laws that could. we function under now. And the numbers right? allowed it. Yeah. And now there is no, well we're just starting to get back to including the treaty into a lot of things to ensure that there are some of the traditional original values of Māori incorporated into our society. Um, but if there was a constitution formed when the second European turned up on this land, um, things would be quite a bit different. We would still have a good society, but there'd be a lot of guidelines as to how that society is shaped and, and how the laws of the land were, were created and, and what they included or didn't include, etc, etc. Yes, I agree. If there were only two major cultures in New Zealand, and if Māori were the majority culture, it would have been steered towards uh, their cultural values. Yeah. The uh, fact of the matter is when the Europeans came here, uh, on first contact there's run about 500,000, 750,000 Māori. But with the introduction of the, the European communities and the diseases that they brought, uh, outside of the laws that devastated our yeah. population, you also had uh, diseases that the Europeans had a natural immunity to, but we did. There was a, a point in time when I, uh, very soon after claiming Conte and post 1840, that the population of New Zealand Māori went from six, seven hundred thousand down to fifty thousand. Yeah. Well, on that basis, because we might have to stop this, because it might, it might stop all by itself. So. <laughs> um, um, I think it's just key to. to, to to say to people, we need a constitution as the foundation for the future. Um, let me make a final comment regarding wealth distribution. Uh, wealth distribution uh, can only happen if we identify who the owners are. If it is the case that Māori are the legal owners and the Crown are the trustees, then does everybody else have rights? And the answer has always been yes. Yeah. As uh, as Manuhiri, they have beneficial rights. Yeah. So you can have a legal owner, you can have a beneficial owner, and you can have a trustee that have a, has a, guess, a executive ownership, and we can live in harmony with one another. But unless you have a written constitution, that ain't going to happen. Yeah, because all that needs to be clearly defined and stated, so everyone knows. For our benefit, the position. obviously. Yeah. But at the moment, the Crown Police owns everything. Yeah. Which is. Wrong. No, well, wrong. Yeah, I was going to. I was going to be 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 a soft and say not not good, but basically wrong. A, yeah. While the yeah. servants become the master. Yeah. And it's absolutely wrong, uh, constitutionally, fundamentally. It's wrong, and yeah. uh, written constitution will change that. Yeah. Oh, well, well, thanks very much. Thanks. And um, yeah, we shall move to another place and do another short work. <laughs>